What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Team Chat Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Jarrett Wilson, joined by Rachel Mogan. How's it going? And Team Chat Podcast is a video game podcast where we talk about games, the ones we love, the ones we hate, and everything in between. If you want to get in contact with us, you can do that by sending us an email at teamchatpodcast at gmail.com, liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter, and also now, we've had it for a few weeks now, but it's a new addition, place, another place you can follow us on our Instagram at Team Chat Podcast over on the Instagram. So follow us there. You can also subscribe to our YouTube and iTunes channels. If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash team chat podcast, where as for as little as a dollar a month, we will give you some cool perks like getting the episodes early before their general Tuesday release and access to our private team chat podcast discord server. All right. Well, before we get to the topic of the day, we do have some news and upcoming releases. Oh boy. It's going to be a little bit of an interesting month. So on the day that this episode releases, we have a couple of things coming out. The Devil May Cry HD collection. Ah. Very cool stuff. PS4, Xbox One, and PC. That's March 13th for those of you that don't know what day it is. Uh, Golem PSVR. Woo. Uh, See, this is why I need Zach here to be able to snark upon VR the way that I do. (laughs) And then we also have Kirby Star Allies for the Switch coming March 16th. That's one of Nintendo's big titles for the year. Burnout Paradise Remastered uh, for PS4 and Xbox One, also March 16th. And a little bit later down the line, we have Assassin's Creed Assassin's Creed Rogue Remastered. That's right, I forgot. Yeah, Assassin's Creed Rogue Remastered PS4 and Xbox One March 20th along with Attack on Titan 2 for uh, PS4, Xbox One, PC, and Switch. Sea of Thieves. Oh, that's finally coming out. Yes, one of the few titles that Microsoft has actually been pushing really hard that is going to be one of their exclusives, one of their only exclusives for the year, so everybody cross your fingers and hope it does well so that they'll make more. Uh, And Titan Quest for PS4 PS4, and Xbox One, all of those titles coming out March 20th as well. Nice. And we already talked about all the other news in our bonus episode recently That's right. over we, the weekend. We recently just, did, we released one, it, it would have come out last Saturday, uh, so the uh, the 10th, I believe, is what that day was, is when this bonus episode came out, where we went over really kind of in depth the Nintendo Direct from March 8th, and then some other announcements that came out that day. So check that out, should be on our YouTube, uh, Sound. you should be able to find it on iTunes, everywhere that we put out episodes. It's there. It's Go jam-packed back. with really important news, it you guys. Is. You should go Lots watch it. Lots of big it. stuff, <laughs> which we can talk about again. Smash! Smash! I actually watched like a, uh, a compilation uh, of, reactions. Morning, of reactions. Oh, my God. They were so good. <laughs> They're so just good. Just these streamers <laughs> just losing their freaking minds. <laughs> it's like that, I, figures. When I saw your... I think you actually, because I was busy doing something, wasn't looking at Twitter, kind of forgot it was even happening... And then I saw, I think you tweeted like, oh, no, you sent it on the Discord. You were like, oh, my God, smash. And I was like, what? (laughs) See, you got to be paying attention. I I know, I know. I was, I just got like completely wrapped up in this project that I was needed to get done. And then, and then I just looked down and saw that and was like, no way. I was at my actual job watching the direct and I was like, gosh, I hope nobody comes by (laughs) because I am am not, no, because I just blatantly was not doing work. I was like, nope, I'm watching the direct. This is all of my attention is on just this. About 30 minutes. Okay. See, you can, you you can (laughs) spend, you're, you're free to spend 30 minutes here or there. All right. Well, anyways, so yeah, the big news from the direct smash 2018 and a bunch of new stuff for Splatoon. Yep. Everybody's happy. Very good. So our topic of today, what we wanted to talk about, is we're going back to a volume two of favorite NPCs. I we did this one a long time a ago. A long time ago. Like, remember when we were going to do part two of, I think it was maps, like yeah. multiplayer maps? We? And we were all like, oh yeah, it hasn't been that long. We did it back oh, on yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then we were all super wrong, and it had been like 80 episodes so, since I we had done I don't even remember maps. necessarily how long ago this one was. I meant to check before we started. It was in the early game. I'm going to I'm going to. I'm, I'm gonna go on ahead and say that it was probably in the first 20. I would say so too, because I was trying to think, I know I didn't repeat anybody. Yeah. But but I was also trying to think of, because I knew I did Varric Tethras from uh, Dragon Age. Oh, right. I know I talked about him. I talked about him in that one, and then when we did Favorite Weapons, when I talked about his crossbow, Bianca. Bianca. Um, but yeah, I was trying to think of who else I was talking about, uh, but I know I know for sure I didn't. And since the time that we did that one, a bunch of new games have come out featuring a bunch of new NPCs. Yep. Or we've just played new games, because some of mine are like from older games, but mine not are- sorry. Mine are... Mine are actually from a, a nice mix of one I've played. Actually, they're they're all pretty recent. One one of them is is farther back. One of them we'll be able to go off of together. Oh, well. okay, gotcha. So. Why don't we start with that one then? All right, all right. 
what's your first one? Chloe Price. <laughs> oh, you're so basic. Oh, come on. Mine is Max Caulfield. I'm just kidding. Seriously? No, no she's a really. playable character. She's, I know. I'm just kidding. Which I do have to put the caveat. Chloe you. Price is a playable character in, in Life is Strange Before the Storm, but I'm obviously picking but her from We're Life talking is about Life is Strange's Chloe Price. So Good she's technically choice. my number one. Like, Good choice. Throwing that out there. I should have picked Joyce. <laughs> Joyce would have been a good one, Joyce too. Joyce was so cool. But so, Chloe, what uh, what motivated you to choose her as your favorite NPC? What qualities about her attract you? Because if I had been Max, and I had met Chloe after coming back after that long of an absence, I would have been like, wow, you kind of suck now. <laughs> I mean, she, she definitely has her I issues. I probably would have pieced out. I would have been like, I'm not here for this kind of emotional burden. No, I agree. <laughs> I would I have agree. run for the hills. I agree. And I mean, yes, yeah, she definitely has some flaws. She's definitely not perfect in any way. Like, you know, she's very moody. She's very sarcastic. She does them drugs and smoke. And did we discuss what ending did you choose? So okay, this is so a little spoilers. spoilery. Yeah, Actually, big, it's not a little spoiler. It's big. It's spoiler. like the whole life it's the end of the game. Yeah, end of the game. I chose. Uh, so, spoiler alert. Yeah, for real. Mute. Don't listen if you're gonna. Yeah. For the next fifty like, seconds. Yeah. Skip like a minute ahead. You'll be good. I chose that she died. Good. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I like. I feel in my heart that that's the correct choice. I do too. Like yeah. how how you could do it with everything that how the game set up and how it gets to the point where you can get to the point where you're like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Arcadia Bay burn to the fucking ground. Well, see, what's funny is when Bro Mogan and I were talking about it because he loves Life is Strange too. He was like, how could you? <laughs> no, I did go back though and watch the cutscene. I found it on YouTube. See, the cutscene for for what happens. I haven't watched it, so actually, don't tell me because okay. I feel like that is a game that I definitely want to replay. Oh, me too. After I'll play I've it had a point. nice absence, because for God's sake, I want to get to where Kate doesn't die. Like that's in kind of the early. Oh, game. because you messed that up. Yeah, I messed it up, and I I was like. Wow! So I want to go back and try to save Kate. Oh, I guess you didn't mess it up. You just went a different way. Yeah, I just went the wrong way and she died. So yeah, yeah I kind of messed it up. So I want to save Kate and maybe do a couple of other things differently as well. I was a real bitch to Victoria the whole game. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was trying to be nice to... Oh, oh, my God. What episode was it? 15. Oh, I was right! Yeah. So, oh, so yeah, that's what I talked about, about Varric. Um, uh, Zach brought up Cave Johnson from Portal, Cave and you talked to Cave Johnson from Portal, and you. That's, that's Nora. Uh, Nora from a uh, your sister, Child of Light. Nora from Child of that's Light. Right. Oh, man, Child need, of Light, man, what a good that game! Is, that is a good game. I need that's to play that so one, old. <laughs> that was <laughs> fifteen <laughs> episode fifteen. But yeah, so okay, so now I want to see if I still have. Sorry, everybody, I should have definitely done this before, but I'm still keeping up. I'm still talking. But no, so Chloe Price. I liked her a lot because she was one of the more complex characters that I feel like I'd run across in, in recent gaming. You know, Absolutely. she was, she was very conflicted. You, and that came across very clearly in the storylines, how, you know, she obviously didn't like, she was very upset at the world because of Max leaving her father dying and then being her mother remarrying David, who was yes. kind of an asshole. Yeah. She was not nice to David either. Didn't make it any easier on the guy, but still, but then you can still tell this, there's this part of her that, I mean, that obviously wishes that her life wasn't the way it is, but that that wish that wishes she could be more like Max. Yeah. And, you know, and then and, but then ultimately, you know, she can't she's more stuck in her ways now. And then obviously all the things going on with the disappearance of then her friend, Rosie Amber. So the, she's had a lot of bad go against her. Yeah, she has. And it's just in the, the, the progression of the game. I just seriously enjoyed Wat- watching the, her character progression really is the best way to put it. She starts off cold and hard against the world. By the end of the game, she's you know she's softened up to Max. She's softened up to others and the plight of others, understanding what's going on. Ultimately, spoilers again. Yeah, hear muffs everybody. She then makes the choice to. T- she tells Max. She's the one who convinces Max herself to that she is the one who has to die to then be able to. To fix Save all of the, the time of and everybody. reality. Yeah, and I thought that was a huge leap in her character progression. Absolutely. At the beginning of the game, she would have like, been like, uh, no. Yeah, she would have been like, hell no, get the fuck out of here, no way. But in the case of you actually interacting with, of Chloe actually interacting with Max for that long of an amount of time, I feel like it did kind of rehumanize her in a way. Yes. Because it seemed like she had been very emotionally closed off from pretty much everyone in her life except for Rachel. Yeah. And Rachel, her disappearance kind of just sent everything spiraling even even deeper down. And I mean, even after Chloe discovers that Rachel is in fact dead, Mm -hmm. I feel like that at least does bring her closure, which might help with that emotional progression towards being a little bit more kind 
in the face of the world. I mean, she does choose to make, or at least wants Max to choose to make, a huge sacrifice based on her. And that's a huge deal for her character progression. It's yeah. very uh, rewarding to watch, for sure. Definitely, definitely. And so that's why she stuck out in my head a lot, because just because... Uh, like I said before, when we talked about Life is Strange, the episode, like that is one of the very few games that has, I can put it on a list. It's actually a list of two. Uh, Last of Us and Life is Strange are the only games that have given me such a strong, like emotional impact and like emotional feeling and actually just like, not, not tearing up, but like on the like kind of feeling it all welled up and just like what is what is this feeling inside? Just let it go, Jared. You know, and just so, let the tears flow. And a lot of that was because of, and then especially too, like the really, not only Chloe's character progression, but then her relationship and the growth and the growth that her relationship with Max undergoes. You know, at the very beginning, she's very mad at Max. She's very, uh, you know, understandably, Max kind of was shitty and didn't talk to her and write to her in years, at, especially well, after so losing. So they had texts. That's true. We know that they but had like, phones at that point, so it's a little crazy. Yeah, yeah, they, that they didn't keep in contact. But so them, them being able to rebuild there and, you know, Chloe slowly taking down her walls around Max and then being at the very end, you know, it's very obvious that if things had gone differently in the game that they would have been in, a, you know, they would have continued to have been in a relationship with each other, yeah. not just friends, like actual, like, yeah. you know, as No, a, that they made that perfectly clear. Yeah. And so, and so that was just an even better uh you know just an another reason why i very much loved that seeing that interaction you know and then all the little things in the game like when you're when you're playing as max you know like the part in the room was like where chloe dares you to kiss her and you're just like and she's like do it you know whatever and then you you know and all those little moments the, the with them in the in the pool you know at the when they break into the school and all that different stuff just these these moments of them like going being able to forget for a moment the shitty circumstances that they're currently living in and just being high school and just being high school. that's like normal high school stuff yeah so it was absolutely a journey that 10 out of 10 would play again absolutely and so that and so and then obviously bonus points uh ashley birch does her voice exactly boom so boom. good good reasons there so that was my number one so i actually did find earlier hey remember our big excel sheet that we did of all oh, of our God. topics <laughs> that we quit updating after like episode oh, what were episode my other 30? ones i forgot you them. actually didn't fill this in so <laughs> <Whoops>. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so yeah. So uh, the uh, but we do have uh, we got so I did Voss from Far Cry Three, Varric Tethras from Dragon Age, and John Marston from Red Dead Redemption. So I guess we were actually not only doing this one to uh, playable to non playable characters because John Marston obviously is the main character of mm. Red Dead. Maybe it was just like characters. Yeah, yeah. But I then all know. of all of Zach's uh, he did three four three Guilty Spark from Halo. Oh yeah. Quiet from Metal Gear Solid and Cave Johnson from Portal. All excellent choices. Yep. And Fantastic. I don't know who you did because you didn't do your homework. My bad. <laughs> I didn't do my homework. Luckily, I don't think I've accidentally repicked anybody twice. No. I mean, I think I feel like if you got started on somebody, I mean, you yeah. obviously know the one from Child of Lights. So as long as you didn't do Nora from Child of Light, no, you'll I be didn't. fine. He's like, damn it. Scratch it out. I gotta think of somebody else real quick. Um, so, so yeah, so that is my number one. All right. What was I gonna say? What were we talking about? Oh, we're going with your number NPCs. Two, with your, yeah, NPCs. Your number, your number. One, three. What? It doesn't matter. I guess I'm just starting. Because Chloe was supposed to be yeah, my number one. Yeah, I'm not going to go <laughs> We're not going to rank this shit anymore. So I guess I'm going to go first and foremost with the one that is both kind of newer and older. Uh, I know that at least one of our frequent uh, patrons will really appreciate this one as well. Um, Tom Nook. From the Animal Crossing series. Okay. Are you familiar with I'm Mr. Not, Nook? I'm not familiar so with Mr. Nook Mr. at all. So, Mr. Thomas Nook, as as it were, uh, is a character that's been in the Animal Crossing series for a little while. I know him most prominently from Animal Crossing New Leaf. So the whole setup of Animal Crossing, for anyone that doesn't know, is you are basically in charge of a little tiny town made up of like max five to ten villagers. And your villagers want all kinds of stuff. They have their own houses. You have to make the town look really beautiful. And the currency that you need, uh, bells, mm -hmm. in Animal Crossing, uh, you need a lot of it. If you're going to get all of the available upgrades, not only to your own home, but to the town as well, as far as like building projects and making new uh, stuff in town for your villagers. And who do you go to when you need a whole bunch of bells that you don't have? Tom Nook? A banker. And Tom Nook is the town's resident banker and money bags that he just, he apparently has endless supplies of funds. And the great thing about Tom Nook is that 
for whatever reason, I mean, it's Animal Crossing, so not for whatever reason, right. but for whatever reason, he's apparently like a bazillionaire, and he's just a super... Just Mr. Moneybags? Yeah, he's just a super cool dude about it. So he's like a raccoon, for starters. He's like a little raccoon, or some people might even say he looks like a tanuki, you know, like from Mario. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he has two sons, Timmy and Tommy Nook, and they're adorable, and they... <laughs> yeah, they're so cute! And they run the local, uh, what's it called, convenience store. And you can kind of help them as like a side quest, beef their store up, and it turns out being really light, really nice, like a department store instead of just a little corner shop. Yeah. But Tom Nook is fascinating because he will give you all like literally millions of bells at a time at no interest. He'll just be like, hey, I heard you want to add a basement onto your house. Well, that's going to be about... So you don't have to pay him back ever? No, you do. But he'll be like, okay, I'll give you the loan for the 500,000 bells. Uh, you have to pay it back before you can build any new additions onto your home. But I'm not going to give you a deadline by when you have to pay it back. Uh, and I'm not going to charge you any interest. Pay back. What a, what a pay good guy. back at your own pace. So what, he's he's not the what's the guy from It's a Wonderful Life? The bat the bad Oh, banker. I don't remember he's what his name guy. is, but he's definitely not that guy. No, he's like the nicest dude on planet Earth. And he wears like just a cool green sweater and like khakis and he's like clearly <laughs> I, I want him to have like a like a no. like a, 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 a pocket watch and no, like a monocle. Hang on, let me show this to I you. I need to see You'll, what Tom knows. He doesn't looks like. have a, I feel like he could definitely rock the monocle, but he doesn't. Everything you're saying to me screams monocle and pocket watch. It, no, look at this fantastic man. He's so Raccoon. silly. Oh, I've seen him. Okay, I know. He's adorable. It. Yeah, so anyone that's familiar with Animal Crossing, he's one of like the very visible primary characters. Yeah. He's one of the NPCs that you interact with the most, and he's got his own amiibo. So if you're really into there amiibo, there's a, uh, there's a Nook amiibo. And what's extra hilarious about this is that kind of what made me think of him as one of the optional characters for my list is in Pocket Camp... He doesn't actually have a physical presence in the game. But, you know, Pocket Camp has microtransactions mm -hmm. in the form of those leaf... Uh, what are they called? Leaf dollars? What are they called? Good God. Leaf tickets. Leaf tickets. Jesus. Yeah, okay. I knew it wasn't dollars. Yeah, no, so uh, in the game of Pocket Camp, you have both bells, which are like free currency that you can get in-game by completing tasks, and then there are leaf tickets, which are your microtransactions. So you can actually pay real money to get more leaf tickets, and basically it's just like a shortcut to making the game really, really great. Uh, if you look at the leaf tickets purchasing page and scroll all the way down to like the largest package of leaf tickets you can buy at a time, the image attached to it, you know, at first it's like, oh, a small stack of cash of yep. leaf tickets, a larger stack of cash, mm. a little bit larger one. The final one is Tom Nook in a bathtub filled with leaf tickets. That is true. You can pull Straight up Pocket Scrooge Camp. Straight Scrooge McDuckin' it. Scro just Scrooge McDuckin' it, like just chilling in his hot tub That's of amazing. leaf tickets. And I was like, man, at least they're honest. <laughs> at least they're being honest about it. And it cracks me up. And that's why I love Tom Nook. He's clearly rolling in dough, literally, and he's still going to be super cool to you about it. What a he's good still going to lend you some of his bazillions of bells and be like, sure, kid, pay it back whenever. I've got so much money. What do I care? Although My sons it are It really successful. doesn't make him much sense economically to be so fast and loose with his bells. Well, I assume that he's also probably like the founder and CEO of his son's business. It's so possible. he's probably getting some dividends on the side That's from true. their from the board. roaring success. Yeah, he's got to be on the board of directors. <laughs> but, you know, Tom Nook is one of those people that in... A video game post-apocalyptic apocalyptic world. I would want him on my side. Sounds like it. Yeah, I he want would access still be to the looking bells. out for the good of the people. Yeah, he's looking out for people. That's good. If you died as mayor in AC in the Animal Crossing, which can't happen, but if you did, I feel like he could take over. Nice. I feel like it would be okay. Very nice. So Tom Nook, everybody, resident wealthy man of Animal Crossing, <laughs> resident money bags of Animal Crossing. <laughs> So my uh, next one on the list, number two, comes from a more recent game, one I'm still currently playing, Assassin's Creed Origins. <gasps> is it is it a, a random kitty on the street that you can pick up and pet? No. Oh. Although there are a lot of random kitties on the street that Good. you can pet. <laughs> but no, it actually is a character who is, uh, he's part of the Nomad's Bazaar, basically. It's this place you can go. He is in random cities and towns throughout the map, and he always will offer you a daily quest that if you complete, you'll be able to, uh, you'll get like a, a cool new piece of gear uh, nice. but his name is Reda but what makes Reda so interesting and fun is that he's actually like a 10 year old kid <laughs> and he's running this bazaar and what makes it even more funny is some of the missions he gives you are like 
hey, some bandits ripped off from this buddy of mine. Uh, why don't you go kill those bandits? Oh, my God. <laughs> but he's like, and you're just like, all right, I am the Magi of Egypt. I am a sworn protector of this land. I must go do this. <laughs> I must go kill for a 10-year-old. <laughs> Pretty Good much. Lord. <laughs> and so it turns out that, like, he t- he's one of those characters, but he's always, like, kind of crafty and, like, or not really crafty. He's just, you don't really know what to believe when he tells you things in your brief conversations he's with him sly. before. He's sly. Yeah, he's sly. Yeah, okay. He comes in and you, like, like I was just playing the other day, and, you know, you'll whenever you come talk to him, you and Bayek will have, like, a, a little conversation before he tells you what the quest is. And this one was just, like, Bike walks up to him and he's just like, ah, oh, Red, uh, you know, I'm so, I'm so impressed by, you know, by your ability to hold down this, no, this bizarre, you know, take your wares across Egypt, you know, make me proud. I wish you could be my, my son kind of thing. And Red is like, you would not want me to be your son. My family were all murdered by, by bandits and left out in the, you know, all this stuff. And so I hired all this, basically just goes on this like horror story of how he like exacted revenge on these bandits and Bike's like, <laughs> oh my god get what me away. a funny lad you are <laughs> because he's basically he's told like by multiple stories of how his fa- his parents met their untimely demise and oh all this gosh. other stuff and how he came so you don't know like did they really meet an untimely demise did you force them to meet this untimely demise because you're a 10 year old with really big entrepreneurial aspirations oh where you want gosh. nothing to stand in your way i don't know it's so he's just this fun little character but that's the thing that i love the most about it, is just he's just like uh come check out my wares oh you want to win you want to help me out Go kill those fools over there. Wow. What a but badass. It's, it's pretty funny because, yeah, he just like sets you up on all these random ass what is his little name? things. Reda. I've actually got a picture yeah, of him. Yeah, yeah, show up. me. I want to see this kid. So, <laughs> that's him. Oh my He's gosh. He's just like a literally a 10 year old kid. What? A and boss. so, yeah. And so he just worms around with his camel. Gives all this stuff. So he's the more murderous Tom Nook of Egypt. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> They're right on the same level. He just is <laughs> like, you know, I'm not going to play fast and loose with my stuff. So if Timmy you and Tommy to Nook, back. If, if Mr. Nook got killed off in perhaps some sort of bandit scenario, Timmy and Tommy could wind up like this kid. Yeah. So it says, so yeah, so I heard that one that was like the the, the story about like where bandits killed them. Uh, he did say like these these uh, bounty hunters of Egypt, the Falakatai. Uh, caught them and caught them stealing and boiled them in a bronze bull. Uh, but then he does <laughs> later tell Bayek, this is according to the wiki on this char- the wiki article on this character. He says that he told Bayek that his father was poisoned by his mother and that she was later killed by a hippopotamus. <laughs> so he's got great origin he's story. He's got a great origin. Like you've got to turn I out. I hope Assassin's awesome. Creed <laughs> Assassin's Creed Origins Two is ready. <laughs> you're playing as it Red needs. Up. In fact, I would even take. So you know how there's like Mario. There's Mario games, yeah. and then there are smaller games like Captain Toad, like right. the Puzzler. Right. I want a side Assassin's Creed game that is very like resource management and economically based strategy where you play as him and you just manage awesome. the bazaar. It'll be kind of like the Sims. Like a turn based strategy yeah. almost thing of, yeah. oh, I would be into that. Ooh, I would be really somebody into Somebody right into Assassin's Creed. I've got ideas. That sounds, that sounds like, because every once in a while Assassin's Creed has like thrown in trying to do these mini games. Like I remember in Assassin's Creed Revelations they had like a fort defense mode thing oh. where like you had these strongholds that the that p- people kept trying to raid and you would have to do this thing of like placing soldiers on rooftops and different things like that calling in special abilities to like defend off the attack. It was kind of one of those things that's like in the, when you're playing the game and everybody when the game came out was like it's cool I guess but why? Yeah. You know like why do we need to have this? It doesn't really feel like it needed that addition but if that was like a whole standalone game like a little side game. Think like, like Zoo Tycoon. Yeah. But no, I'd Ray be all Doc. about that. I'd be all about that. <laughs> that would be super cool. But yeah so you come to him he'll give you this or you can buy these uh, chests from him that give uh, that give things but that yeah, give things, that Jared. Give, <laughs> totally. What are the work. things that, that gives uh, that gives rewards equal to what you would get from oh, doing the okay. quest? But the quest you would get more experience by actually, like you know, gotcha. defeating enemies, uh, clearing out locations, different things like that. So it's more beneficial to do the actual quest than spending three thousand of your gold to to buy the chest. But you're then able to at least you know you don't have to spend as much time on it. Gotcha. Awesome. So yeah, so that was another one of my characters. Right very down. nice. Very nice. All right. So my number two is kind of a two-for-one, oh, you could say. A twofer. A twofer, in a way, but not really, but maybe it what depends it? on how you think of physics. It's the Lutes twins 
from Bioshock Infinite. Okay, so I don't know who these are either. Do you not know who they no, are? I still got to, um, got to Infinite yet. You may have seen them in the trailers, so let me actually pull up like an image of them because they are very stylistically fantastic. Okay. So, of course, one of the best things um, about the Lutest twins is stylistically just for me, they're really cool to look at. They both have red hair. They wear, of course, old-timey clothes. Think circa like early 1900s, like okay. turn of the century kind of uh, clothing. And they're very how would you say it the kindest way? They're very eccentric. Ah. Uh, in mostly the way that they are both eccentric geniuses. Do you recall seeing them at any point? No. Oh, because they are a big, prominent part of the game. So this is going to be a little bit spoilery. Okay. So if anybody hasn't played Infinite I and you think that someday now, you might, uh, they're not the end-all be-all of the story, but what they did really sets off the entire game. So they actually are the first people you ever meet in-game. This is uh, when you first start up the game, you as Booker, you're on a little tiny boat, like literally a rowboat out in the middle of a stormy ocean at night, and the two people rowing you to a lighthouse in the distance are the Lutest twins. Oh, okay. And they're both dressed in like yellow rain slickers, and they're always just having their own conversation kind of around you. Really, anytime you interact with them, they're talking to you, but also they're just talking to each other. And you're just kind of like a bystander on their ongoing conversations about physics and the universe and the mysteries of life. Because they're basically quantum physicists, oh, both of them. Okay. So they are the ones who take you to the lighthouse, which spurs all of the rest of the events of the story to take place. Now, this is going to get, in, again, into very spoilery territory. So if, you're, if you want to play the game and you want some things not spoiled, don't listen to this part. Uh, Rosalind Lutes is technically the one of the twins that is from Columbia. So mm -hmm. Columbia is the flying city in the sky. She's the scientist that got Columbia to fly in the first place. Okay. So in the context of this universe, she's the genius that made all of Columbia happen with the might of, what's his name? Uh, who's the main bad guy? God, why am I blanking on his name? Looking at the wrong oh person. Oh my God, what is wrong with me? Anyways, crazy old man, we'll call him. He's just a crazy... I'll look it up for you while you're Yeah, talking. look it up for me. I can't remember his name. Man, that's really going to bother me. But so basically, she's been enabled by the main antagonist of the game to build this city and make all of these amazing things happen. And Columbia is full of crazy technology that's really just entirely fictional because it's supposedly all made by Rosalind Lutes. And she has this twin brother, Zachary Robert. Hill, Comstock? Comstock! I couldn't remember it. Comstock, yes. So Lutes is basically in cahoots with Comstock to make all of this happen. And she has this twin brother, Robert. And Robert seems to be, at least from my perspective, like kind of the dumb twin. He's obviously not. He's like also a genius. Right. But usually all of the genius talk is coming from Rosalind. And it seems like they're always kind of fighting each other, like on the side, like, no, I'm right, no. I'm right. <laughs> you know, much the way that any siblings right. would be. Good old sibling but rivalry. Exactly. Little sibling rivalry. And their conversations kind of gradually clue you in to the deep lore of the game. And eventually, if you can piece together all of their inter interactions and all of their side materials, like you can find uh, voxophones, which are like recordings that have been pre-made by characters from the game. If you can find all of those and piece together all of them, you realize... Big spoiler, people. Big spoiler that they are not twins at all. <gasps> Rosalind has found a way to open portals to other dimensions, like basically parallel dimensions. And in doing so, she encountered herself in another dimension in a slightly altered state. Robert. Oh. So she, as Rosalind, she opened a portal. She found herself, but she's Robert. And actually, one of the very first uh, recordings you can hear in the game from one of these vo voxophones is Rosalind is saying, when I was young, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was myself. And I was looking at myself, but I was not myself. Interesting. And later on, you realize that's just a precursor to what is actually the reality that she brought Robert herself in another dimension to Columbia. Because for whatever reason, they just really wanted to be together. And I think that largely it's from a research perspective. Yeah. Because what's better than one genius? Two. Two geniuses. geniuses. And if that genius is also yourself, that's just like a thousand times the genius. Yeah. So they really do a lot of things that are very morally questionable. They are in no way, shape, or form good scientists from an ethical perspective. Mm. And together with their sort of um, parallel dimension bending technologies, they are what brought Elizabeth 
from Booker's original reality to the reality of Columbia. Okay. And that's what starts off all of this time bending, all of this reality bending is them. They are the entire impetus for the rest of the game. And that's why I love them as NPCs. A, they're hilarious. Their dialogue is very interesting. And as long as you can actually tell what they're saying, they tell you a lot about the game that you might have otherwise missed if you weren't paying attention to them. So, Rosalind and Robert Lutes twins. Ah, oh, very good, very good, very good. All right, well, my last one that I have picked out comes from, and I feel like it's been a long enough time since I've talked about this game in some capacity or another that I can talk about it again now. It is Bill from The Last of Us. Bill. 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 I'm not sure I know who Billium. Bill is. Billium. <laughs> I'm not sure I know who that is. So sir. you run into Bill uh, when Joel and Ellie are on their travels. Uh, they know Joel, Joel has interacted with Bill before on many occasions, and knows that Bill owes him a lot of favors and that Bill has access to vehicles which they need to be able to complete their their journey. So they decide, okay, Joel's like, all right, well, I know this guy. He can get us a car. Let's go talk to him. And so you meet Bill in his town, which pretty much just kind of called, there's actually a multiplayer map in it. It's just called Bill's Town. And so you just play. But he is pretty much is the only inhabitant of this town. He used to have a, a someone there with him that he alludes to and, and, and like talks about in brief instances, but that person has, has since left. And so it was, uh, and he doesn't know where he is and all that other stuff. And so, but Bill is now pretty much hermitized himself inside this town. He's put traps everywhere, you know, because obviously all the infected are out there, the clickers and all this other stuff that they're, he's trying to avoid, but he also wants to avoid other people who come snooping around and stuff. Cause he's got, been able to acquire quite a stockpile. Of so stuff. he's the Tom Nook. Of <laughs> I guess the so. last of us, you can, they're all yeah. the Tom Nook. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, so, but just not quite near as giving and generous as <laughs> the other as the other Tom Nook iterations. He's going to charge about. you interest through the roof. <laughs> well, hopefully no interest because you apparently he apparently owes you all these favors. Yeah. But so you meet Bill, and it's it's a uh, he's just kind of you immediately get off on the wrong foot because you a sneak through all his traps to get to find him and everything. And you like bust into his, his like compound. He tries to take you hostage. And then, uh, in the process of that, like you're all, he's all mad and pissed off. And Ellie, who is a hot cannon, you know, is like, is able to get out of her restraint and starts beating him in the head with a pipe. And then Joel has to like, stop it. And then that instantly sets Joel and Bill is, I mean, Ellie and Bill is being, Enemies and snide to each other well, for the rest of the time. Well, if you get beaten the head with a pipe by yeah, a kid, you're probably not going to like that kid. No, but so <laughs> Bill is just a very interesting character, and, and more in the way in that how a he's voiced by a, a he's voiced and mo, and mo capped by W. Earl Brown, who's an actor who uh, you he's mo, I came to know him mostly from Deadwood, uh, and so he actually Bill looks just like the character, just like W like uh, Earl Brown, and so. He's kind of, which is kind of funny because it's like the supposed apocalypse and, you know, he's a, a portly, a more portly fellow, which is, comes to his various jokes. Like, you know, Joel's like asking for food and he's like, I don't want to give up any of my food. And Ellie's like, you obviously have some despair because you've still kept apparently quite the healthy body size, <laughs> you know, body size and so all this other stuff. And so he, they just have this, a lot of snide conversations, a lot of back and forth, but he does eventually decide to help you. And he goes to where that he he takes you to where there was an old military vehicle, and and every and that's supposed to have a new fresh battery because the car that he has has a dead battery. Oh yeah, they did the oh, okay. Yeah, see, he I does. Gotcha. He looks just like the, yeah, the actual does. actor. Gotcha. And so uh, you go, and so that eventually you have to wind up going to a nearby town because the military vehicle isn't there anymore. And so you try to go to this other stuff, and you go into this house, and this is the one moment that really kind of it, it had been alluded to in little bits but you didn't really understand it until this moment is that you're going into this new this next this nearby town looking around for more auto parts or something to, or another working vehicle you go into this one house talking arguing as you are with most of the time with bill bill looks up though and like stops in his tracks stops what he's doing and there's a dead body hanging hanging in this house well it turns out it's the person he used to be living with in his town frank who you then turn it, find out through Bill's reaction and then some later things later on that they were actually lovers together Aww. and they were in this town, which, so that was the, and so that was part in, and then, you know, Bill, well, what also, happened to Frank? Did he get he killed or did he, he got bit by an infected. Oh, and so and instead of tra- turning into a monster, he killed himself, but didn't want Frank a to know noble death. and all this other stuff. And so, or not, sorry, he didn't want Bill to know. And so he just kind of left, but like, so it was this whole thing of Bill had, you know, thought his partner, you know, in life had left him behind in this, in this place to fend for himself. Cause he just disappeared one day. No, 
no uh, communication, no note, nothing of what had happened. And so now it's like, you're, it's just this tender moment that you get to, sp- to share with this usually very uh, closed off and hardened man. You're now suddenly seeing him at this, like at this weak point, and, you know, it's this, it's this, it's, a, it's one of those instances in The Last of Us that shows even though pretty much the world's gone to shit, there are these, you know, there's still humanity. That sounds like a part that I probably would have cried at. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it's very, it's, it, was, it was very well done because Bill tries to brush it off as not a big thing. But obviously you can tell he's affected by it. Um, and so it's, a, it, but it was also um, it, similar, it, it was also another, an interesting thing I put from a story perspective to at make the fact that Bill was was a homosexual character because you know you even uh, easily could have written that as some as a billion other things. They could have made him a son character, like a, a son father character, son kind of deal. Could have made him just a friend. That's could kind of where I thought you were girl, going with a that. Girlfriend, yeah. but no, but but I thought that was a, a, a great um, inclusion that they that the writers of, of Last of Us decided to put it to put what into it. Just to add did more the Last depth. of Us come out? Twenty thirteen. Oh yeah, okay. So not not that old. Yeah, not gotcha. that old. Last was two. Who knows when it's coming out? Hopefully soon. Frank's return. Ooh. Ooh. He's a big boss. He's a big boss. But no. So it's just one of those things, and it also le- then led to another funnier moment later on with Ellie, and just another uh, great moment of her character. Well, because also Ellie from the from the Last of Us uh, Left Behind DLC learned that she had a relationship with her best with her friend yeah, Riley. So, Riley, that's her name. Um, but no, so you have this other funny moment because it's a funny moment between Joel and Ellie, and, a, and another funny moment between. Uh, of just Ellie's character that you're driving in the truck that you are actually finally able to track down with Bill's help. And it turns out to be Frank's truck. And in the back of it, or, and while you're driving away from the town from Bill's town and everything, Ellie finds out that she stole, uh, male pornographic magazines from Bill. <laughs> but obviously they're all good. And she's like in the back seat looking and she's like, wow, it's so big. And Joel, and Joel in the front is like, don't look at that. Being like the dad character that he's slowly turning That's into. He's like, funny. stop looking at it. And he's like, I, and she's like, I know what it is. You know, and all this, but it was just a very, a That's very funny, really moment. funny. And again, another lighthearted moment in, in this game. That's definitely not about lighthearted. Oh, moments. that's hilarious. Uh, so I, so just for all those different reasons, Bill stood out to me as a, as a, as one of the, I mean, all the characters in the last of us are great, but Bill stood out. They kind of stood out as another great character from that very game that nice. I wanted to highlight. Very nice. My final pick is also, uh, well, not really. He's, he's not nearly as lighthearted as Bill, but my final <laughs> pick is a very lighthearted, pure and good cinnamon roll who we mm, do not deserve. Roll. Yes. Well, now I'm hungry. Seriously. Um, so you talk this about is, rolls? this is a recurring character that goes all the way back to the early 2000s Ooh. and the GameCube days. Ooh, do you think so you can guess who it is? A s- Cinnamon roll. Does, does that is that a hint to anything at all? That's not a hint. Oh man, he, that's just his personality. So it's a person. It's that's a person. Man. It's a dude. You're no, probably I'm not going to. Yeah, you're not going to no. be able to guess it. Uh, so it's Beetle with a D from the Legend of Zelda series. Uh, okay, yeah, no. So do you know? Have you? You've probably seen or heard him because he has a very have. distinctive. Uh, Voice uh, like a very so pull up like what is it B E B E E D L E so type like Beetle just into YouTube and see what comes up first. Is it the ten hours of thank you? Uh, let me see. Yeah, for ten minutes, I got ten. Yeah, oh yeah, get ten minutes of Beetle and just like listen to it real quick. Okay, okay, you can listen to this. It's it's pretty loud. You might not want to hold that close. <laughs> Ten minutes of that, Ten baby. Of that, huh? <laughs> Thank you. Oh. So his voice is very recognizable, and he's originally from Wind Waker. Okay. So the first game that he ever made an appearance in was Wind Waker, and his entire function in the game. I must be really into economics because he's also a merchant. We've all talked about all these like merchant nomads, people who have some kind of currency and power over others. But I mean, that does kind of play into the way that video games are set up because who are you the most likely to run into as an NPC? The person who sells you stuff. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and he's fantastic because it seemed like maybe he would be a one-off character because not all characters in The Legend of Zelda come back, but Beetle will not die. And I'm like, yay, Beetle! Because he's awesome. Every time you go to him, uh, in the context of Wind Waker and its direct follow-ups, Phantom Hourglass and uh, Spirit Tracks, he is a... Well, in Spirit Tracks, he actually has a physical boat? No, no, no. He has a physical shop. 
Yes. Mm. Okay. So sorry. In Spirit Tracks, he's a physical shop, but in Wind Waker and uh, Phantom Hourglass, sorry, I was blanking on it for a minute. He has uh, like moving shops because they're all on boats because those are ocean-based games. So you have to basically like sail over to his boat, jump into the water, and then jump onto his boat just to get to him. And he'll sell you all kinds of stuff. But every time you buy something from him, even if it's like a single pair, he mm-hmm. makes that noise at you, and it's hilarious. Oh, and you're thank like, you. and you're like, you're welcome, Beetle. I'll be back. <laughs> and You're in, such a kind man. In certain instances, you can also find like a special boat, like a Ooh. super special boat that only comes around in super part in special parts of the ocean. And you come onto the boat, and it, you know it's still Beetle, but he's got like this huge kind of almost Athenian style golden helmet on. And he's like, oh, hello there, traveler I've never met before. And it's like, Beetle, I know it's you. <laughs> like, I, I know it's you, Beetle. No, you don't. No. I'm going to buy something. Here you go. Here's money. Oh, thank you. Exactly. And he'll like sell you special items on the special ship, like a piece of heart or an empty bottle, you know, something that's really rare and hard to get. Yeah. But his best two iterations are much more recent. So I thought that maybe he would just be contained to the Wind Waker series, which is, of course, Wind Waker, Phantom Hourglass, and Spirit Tracks. Mm-hmm. Not true. He made a comeback in a big way in Skyward Sword. So in Skyward Sword, you know, you are this uh, airbound city. I'm also really into airbound cities, apparently. Yeah, Gosh, I'm Columbia. predictable. Yeah. So you're so in Skyloft, basic. and I'm so basic. Hashtag basic. So you're in Skyloft, your little floating city, and around your floating city, kind of orbiting on a preset track, is like this little house with a little like helicopter umbrella on it, and like a little rudder, and you're like, where is that little flying house going? And eventually, if you can manage to get the slingshot, you can basically ding the bell that is below the flying house and it'll stop and a little rope ladder comes down over it and the first time you go up you realize inside it's beetle <laughs> and i was like pop it up everywhere <laughs> you're back man so i was so excited that he was back and he his uh function in skyward sword is hysterical because of course he's piloting this little like super janky flying ship that he's literally using as like a bicycle oh wow so in the interior behind the shop counter he's on a little bike bicycle like pedaling it to make all of the helicopter parts move and so you're just like he constantly has to be in motion when his shop is actually crash. in the air or he'll crash. And it's like, Beetle, this seems really dangerous. It's like, but my leg muscles are out of this world. And one of the best things about it is that, of course, you buy things from him. You can get uh, pouch expansions, all kinds of gear, arrows, that kind of stuff. But if you go to his shop in Skyward Sword and then you try to leave without buying anything. The first time this happened, I about lost my mind. So like I get to a shop, I'm like, oh, he actually doesn't really have anything I want. Or I didn't have enough money for what I wanted. So you go to leave and like you get to the door and like a kind of little mini cutscene happens. And like you hear Beetle off to the side going, you come onto my ship and bring all of your extra weight with you which I have to pedal harder to make the ship move, and you have the gall to not buy anything? And then, like, in vengeance, he, like, looks back at you, and he, like, basically just metaphorically gives you a huge middle finger. He pulls a rope, and, like, a trap door just falls out from under Link, and he just splats you, like, what right the onto hell? the ground. He's like, how dare you? And you lose some hearts for it. It's so So much punishment. Funny. It's so much punishment, but it's fantastic. And that's why I love him. And this also introduces Skyward Sword is where they introduced one of his newer qualities that carried over into Breath of the Wild, which is his love of actual beetles. So beetles with a T. In Skyward Sword, one of the big things that you could do was bug collecting. Uh, And if you collected certain types of bugs, specifically like special beetles, you could eventually find where Beetle lived. Because he actually lives out on his own tiny little island away from Skyloft. Mm -hmm. So he lives on his own little sky island that's just like his little beetle paradise and if you go to his island at night because of course during the daytime he's always floating around trying to sell you stuff but if you go to his island at night you'll find his little shop like parked on his island and then like he's just sitting around a campfire and he'll be like holding beetles and loving them and stuff and you can sell him special beetles and he'll give you stuff for it nice so it's awesome Good trade there and that's what they brought over into breath of the wild because beetle is of course your traveling merchant in breath of the wild as well and he has some really funny voice lines uh, at certain points 
you know, in Breath of the Wild is huge, and you can find him at literally every corner of the map, uh, primarily through the stables. Mm -hmm. So you can find him randomly on the road, but you can also almost always find him at a stable. And if you go up to him, he'll be like, oh, fancy that, meeting you here again. We must have been married in a past life. Like, he'll say that to you, and it's what? like, yeah, Beetle, I'm into this. <laughs> <laughs> he's so funny, and he's just like, like if you go to winter or really hot regions, he'll be like, it's so cold. Or like, I'm dying. You're Selling all this stuff, but, Beetle. Surely you have a jacket. But I'm here to sell you these goods because I know you need them. And he's just fantastic. So Beetle for president, 10 out of 10, would purchase again. Very nice. Well, there you have it. Our list of some of our favorite non-playable characters. Again, running down the lists, I had Chloe Price, Rada from Assassin's Creed Origins, and Bill from The Last of Us. And Mogan, what were your selections again? Mine were Beetle from many Legend of Zelda games, uh, the Lutess twins from Bioshock Infinite, and Mr. Thomas Nook. Thomas Nook. Tom Nook from the Animal Crossing series. Very nice. Well, there you have it. Obviously, we'd like to hear some of your favorite non-playable characters that you've run across in your gaming exploits. So send those lists our way. Write a post on our Facebook. Send us a tweet. Send it in our Discord if you're one of our patrons there. Or send us an email at teenchatpodcast at gmail.com. But before we go... Well, then obviously you could comment below on the YouTube video. There's that too. Another option. But before we go, we do have our soundtrack spotlight for this week. The song given to us by Bro Mogan. Andrew Mogan. And it's a good one. Kudos it is to a him. Good one. This is a great suggestion. This is one that I probably never on my own would have gone out to look for. Me neither. I wouldn't to. have known to look for it. I know. So the for the so the game is Dust Force, whereas Bro Mogan says, which I've never played before, but the soundtrack is awesome. Apparently it's a game where you play as a bunch as a squad of janitors cleaning up a bunch of different levels. But the soundtrack made me think the game is about literally anything else, which is exact and he says kind of strange, but oh well, which is exactly when I started listening to it, I was like not what I expected. Not no. what I expected at all. Dude, the entire... So I listened to almost the entire soundtrack at work the other day after he suggested it. It's all really good. Nice. It's all fantastic. You absolutely should go listen to it. Um, I think the entire soundtrack, if you're not looping, is maybe about like under an hour long. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely something that you can just listen to for studying music or just for chill out music. It's awesome nice and it's a uh, it's composed the music is composed by life forms so stick around after the close of the episode where you'll get to hear that soundtrack selection all right but with that that concludes this episode of team chat podcast until next time i'm one of your hosts jared wilson joined by rachel mogan sayonara we'll see you all next time stick around with the song